Well, welcome everybody to uh, the Jean Monnet podcast here at University College Dublin. It's 2020. This is the first podcast we're recording in 2020. And we're joined by Professor Jonathan Hopkins from the London School of Economics. Uh, this week, we have had a PhD winter school in the new political economy of Europe, hosted here at UCD with various very bright PhD researchers, scholars from across Europe. And um, Jonathan gave a presentation today, a discussion on his new forthcoming book, Anti-System Politics, the Crises of Market Liberalism in Rich Democracies. So hot topic, very topical. Um, Jonathan, what's the core claim of this book on anti-system politics? Well, I guess it's all about trying to figure out why our politics seems to be upside down at the moment, why all these weird, unexpected things are happening, Trump, Brexit, and so on, and trying to put forward an explanation which doesn't, which gets beyond the sort of lazy, uh, lazy hot takes of, oh, it's all about racism, it's all about immigration, the refugee crisis, social change, and so on, and looking actually at the really deep root causes in the changing nature of, of capitalism in Western democracies. And, and ultimately, it's those changes that I argue that are driving these, these uh, un, you know, apparently unexpected electoral results. Um, and in particular, the way in which the kind of shift towards very market liberal or neoliberal way of uh, uh, running the economy since the 80s, 90s has made life more precarious, more, uh, more risky, more insecure for most people to the benefit, most obviously, of a wealthy elite at the top, um, and which has left a lot of people sort of wondering where the growth went, and of course then compounded by massive financial crisis, deep recession, which we've not really properly recovered from, which has left a lot of people hurting. So ultimately, these are the reasons why you get Trump, you get Brexit, you get Syriza in Greece. And it's not really to do with the fact that old white men can't cope with uh, social change and gender equality. And I found that part of the book quite interesting. <clears throat> so I've read a couple of chapters of it. And the book is coming out uh, in Europe in June and the USA in April is, you know, it's out of fashion almost in political science now to do those longer term historical analyses looking at the deeper tectonic structural changes that have taken place. And your core argument is that, well, look, there's been massive structural changes in how we organize the economy, the social order of things. You know, Polanyi drew, drew upon this type of analysis in the past. And if you really want to understand what's happening in this decade, in the, in, in the previous decade, we have to go further back in time to identify those structural shifts. And you use the term neoliberalization. There's been a kind of shift towards neoliberal markets, and that has created lots of this social disruption, and that has given uh, rise to different types of politics. But the financial crisis in 2008 clearly is a critical juncture that, that kind of acts as a, a trigger or a deeper spur uh, to all these changes that have articulated the deeper changes that were taking place. But why then did some countries experience a kind of anti-system politics on the right, and some countries experience an anti-system politics on the left? Right, well, you know, one of the main things that I'm trying to get across is that getting beyond the headlines, you know, there are very different ways in which you can be against the system. So, you know, there's a lot of focus on people like Trump, people like Boris Johnson or Nigel Farage, uh, who are talking a, a very nationalist kind of language, who are sort of riling up the base, stoking anti-immigrant sentiment. And obviously these are very kind of right-wing, often far-right positions. Uh, and a lot of the debate on what is very often termed populism or the populist wave um, implies that it's all about people shifting to the right. But actually if we look around, um, there's been a growth of the radical left as well. In some countries, much more than the radical right. I mean, in the US, we have Trump, but we also have Bernie Sanders. We have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. In Britain, despite his recent failure to win an election, Jeremy Corbyn's takeover of the Labour Party marked a dramatic shift to the left um, on the you know, on the left side of British politics. And in Southern Europe, it's been left-wing radical movements that have been 
prospering the most from the aftermath of the financial crisis in Greece. The, the, the left Syriza took over, more or less annihilating the PASOK, which was the sort of mainstream socialist body in Greece. Uh, in Spain, Podemos um, is now entering government with the mainstream socialist party, having taken a large chunk of their electorate. So I just wanted to balance things out and not uh, place all of this emphasis on, on, on the anti-system right. But also, I have a story about why it is that different uh, types of anti-system politics prosper in different countries, and it's to do with the way in which um, welfare states uh, filter the effects of economic problems and protect some groups whilst exposing others to risks. And what exactly is it about the welfare state then that acts as a <clears throat> institutional uh, filter, if you like, that leads to different social groups and identifying and different sides of the political spectrum? Is it because, is it simply a case of whether or not welfare states are protective or redistributive or is there something else going on? Well, there are kind of two dimensions of this. First of all is how much does the welfare state do to cushion society as a whole from, from economic risks? And obviously, we know that there are some countries with very generous welfare states like Sweden, and a lot of Northern Europe countries with much more residual or limited welfare states like in the United States. And obviously, um, my expectation is that Sweden would have less anti-system politics, fewer people going for anti-system uh, parties and candidates than, than in the US, where people are much more exposed to risk. But also, in Europe, you have diversity of welfare states in that you can have countries which have sizable welfare states, but which protect different groups differently. So there's a big difference between North and Southern Europe, in that Southern European welfare states uh, tend to be very generous and protective towards older parts of the population. Pensioners, in particular, do very well. Um, they tend to uh, protect employment that is generally in enjoyed by older male workers, leaving females and younger workers much more exposed to the market. And my working hypothesis is that precisely these kind of voters who are more exposed in the South are much less likely to go for an anti-system right appeal mm. because they're younger and generally have more socially liberal attitudes. Where you have, in contrast, the kind of older, especially male, less educated population, more exposed to social risks, which is the case in declining regions of the UK and the US, for example, then it is no surprise to find that these groups are shifting more to the anti-system right, because the kind of right-wing appeal um, that groups like you know, the Trump or Tea Party wing of the Republican Party or UKIP and the Brexit campaign in Britain uh, appeal to are, are those you know, are less protected by the welfare state and more available to be mobilized around some kind of anti-system appeal. So we've had this big structural shift towards market liberalization from the 80s onwards, <clears throat> let's say. Um, and there was winners and losers and opening up of international markets, international trade, free capital mobility, increased labor mobility, of course, although to less, less an extent. Um, and you know financialization, all these big structural shifts that we talk about in political economy, political science. And you have the financial crisis. The financial crisis hits. You've got austerity. You've got a decade of austerity. Austerity obviously impacts people differently. Uh, you know, in the UK, you had pretty much a large dose of self-imposed austerity by the Tory party. And you know, you get this increase in electoral volatility, parliamentary fragmentation, and. Is it a case that now we're beginning to see this kind of just leveling out, you know? So we've had a rise in anti-system politics, right? And people voting for parties that would be classified in your analysis as anti-system. Other people have called it populist, and we could get into that type of conversation as well. But in your book, you put emphasis also on this creditor-debtor relationship. And you have what's called a kind of crocodile graph, and you, you show that, you know, it is that the right on, in Northern Europe do particularly well and the left do particularly well in, in Southern Europe. So what is it about the creditor-debtor relationship uh, that makes a difference? Is, it, is that a separate story to the welfare state or is there something, what else, what's going on there? It definitely interacts with it. It happens that uh, the cre in a financial crisis, creditors and debtors have conflicting interests, right? Mm. Creditors want to make sure they get their money back in full. Debtors don't want to have to struggle and live miserable lives for decades to pay, pay back their debts, right? And, and the setting and policy, which in European Monetary Union obviously takes place at the European level, um, has a big impact on who takes the strain. 
in resolving those that, that, that conflict. Um, in the Eurozone, clearly policy has been skewed in favor of the creditor countries. Um, and the creditor countries as societies have, an in, have a kind of, they, they are the kind of capitalist elite of the, of the Eurozone, whereas the debtor countries, of which Ireland was an example, but also across the south of Europe, um, these are countries which uh, have, have been running big trade deficits, um, were reliant on financial inflows, and when those inflows dried up, and, and they remain insufficient uh, for, for Southern Europe at least, um, had real, real trouble getting the economy to grow again in such a way as to be able to service their, their, their debt burdens. So this, so their position is more like the, the, the kind of, the, they are the kind of working class of the Eurozone society. They are the people who are struggling with debt, who might favor a more inflationary policy mix, for example, which would make it easier to pay off the debts, and who certainly would favor a kind of more expansionary monetary and fiscal policy, which would uh, allow for, for growth and, again, just make it easier to, to pay down those debts. On the other hand, the North clearly is worried about the risks that that could spark off inflation, which would um, result in them making making losses. So, so there is this, you know, uh, kind of broad international p political economy conflict between uh, the people who who have assets and the people who have mainly liabilities. So, <clears throat> but what about <clears throat> on the kind of political party side itself? <clears throat> you talk a lot in the book about cartel parties. We're in the Peter Mayer boardroom, Peter Mayer Library here, the changing nature of party politics and what political parties do. Are they vehicles of particular constituencies, ideas? And if I understand correctly, what you mean by anti-system politics <clears throat> are people who vote for parties who are just not of the established centre-left or centre-right that dominated European and you know US politics for uh, the best part of three or four decades. Um, so, so it, are we just are we seeing a fundamental change in how party politics operates? Is that what's going on here as well? Certainly in the short run, we have departed from this model of politics which was dominant uh, in, in Europe and the West more broadly between probably the early 1990s and the early 2010s in which all of the kind of mainstream political parties, the parties that were likely to be in government, ended up converging on a kind of fairly limited uh, uh, range of possible policies. They would compete over some issues, so for instance, social issues like gay marriage, for example, is a classic kind of issue on which uh, parties would still be free to compete, but over the kind of big questions of economic and social policy, uh, macroeconomics, the design of the welfare state, um, and, and so on, um, it was very difficult to see the difference very often between, say, the Labour Party under Tony Blair and the Conservative Party under David Cameron, or, or indeed in France between the Socialist Party led by François Hollande, who succeeded the Conservative French President Nicolas Sarkozy. So when voters observe that voting in elections, choosing between these established parties doesn't seem to actually make any difference at all to the policy outcomes, then, especially when times are hard, they might start thinking, well, hang on a minute, if I want my vote to count, I'm going to have to try something else. And of course, waiting in the wings, you have a variety of uh, political forces that are ready to grab those newly available voters and say, hey, we can do something different here. We don't listen to this closed elite. They're only in it for themselves. They're all the same. We're offering something different. And of course, we're going to represent people uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, rather than leave everything in the hands of a shadow elite of bankers and technocrats. So Peter Mayer was right that ultimately a technocratic form of politics and a convergence towards a centre will become unresponsive to citizens' uh, needs, demands, desires, and therefore political entrepreneurs will come along and challenge. Um, Macron in France is arguably right. part of this. Macron arguably could fall into this anti-system politics, even though he's not quite anti-system, but he's not part, he has presented himself and his whole movement, so to speak, has presented itself as not part of the old, it's something sure. new. And I think we almost forget, I think it's, we, it's we're so, we normalize and things and internalize so quick and so fast, not just in political science, but in society at large, but we forget that France doesn't have two center parties anymore. We forget mm. that Italy has now, you know, it's, the, the party system has collapsed. 
Um, but in the book, you make you start off with the interesting observation as well that you know in early, the early 2000s there was a media entrepreneur, a successful businessman who you know was unafraid of being a what's it un, not politically correct, let's say, and we're talking about Berlusconi, right? So right. Berlusconi emerged way before Trump and way before uh, all the other stuff that's going on. So. And today, Italy obviously, arguably, is 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 what's representative of what might happen for other countries. So, 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 should, if we see Berlusconi happening in the early 2000s, should we be at all surprised at what's happening now? I was, I mean, at the time, I was actually in Italy as a PhD student um, when when all that happened, um, and of course, everybody was terribly shocked. But of course, Italy had a long history of being an unusual political system; the government would change every year. Um, it was a country riven by social conflicts, which even resulted in political violence, terrorism of left and right. So people have long seen Italy as some kind of weird kind of basket case of a democracy. And so people tended to dismiss the Berlusconi uh, experience as being an anomaly, something that clearly could never happen here. And obviously, some of the people who were uh, proclaiming that most with the most vigor were American and British political scientists who who couldn't you know imagine that something like that could happen in in their societies. Of course, Peter May was onto all of this before anyone else, and uh, his work is so prescient. And he predicted many of the things that have ended up ended up happening. And and of course, it's a natural consequence that if you have a democracy in which people are invited to cast votes, which are supposed to choose politicians and indirectly then to inform policy. Um, but then voters start to perceive how their votes don't really change policy and that the same politicians seem to be alternating without any real appreciable difference in how the country is governed, then you kind of be surprised if people turn to alternatives. And of course, people who are interested in going into politics will tend to attach themselves to the established political parties where they're most likely to make successful careers. So. So when those parties all of a sudden become unpopular and people want to look elsewhere, well, political entrepreneurs, as we call them, step into, to, into the void. And they can be very unusual personalities. Sometimes people are apparently totally inappropriate for life in politics. And Trump is a contemporary manifestation of that. I mean, any kind of standard view of what a political leader should look like, um, you know, um, Trump doesn't take any of those boxes. Um, and yet, you know, 40 odd percent of Americans voted for him and it's looking increasingly likely that they may do so again. Mm. But beneath all of this more specifically, um, it seems to me we're talking about a crisis of social democracy more concretely if we wanted to narrow in on a, on a particular part. And you do mention in the book that it was the center left that got a bit of a bounce in the 90s because they took a more sort of social liberal turn ahead of the center right, who were still holding on to the more socially conservative vote. So, you know, Tony Blair and Jared Schroeder, the, that new labor was, was beneficial. It captured something new and they were, they, there was a sense that there was something new about this, that they were not part of the old. But that didn't last very long. Um, and today, I mean, I think, it's, I think most people would agree that we are seeing a crisis of social democracy. What's going, what, what explains that? Is that, is that just a, a second order effect of all these other things we're talking about? I mean, you could also say that social democrats are the architects of the, mm. of the, of the political and economic arrangements which have led to the financial crisis and the subsequent recession and the political instability that resulted. Um, if we look at, uh, for instance, the collapse of financial systems after a decade of, of rampant speculation and inability to gauge risk and, uh, and dangerous and often self-serving behavior on the part of the financial elites. Well, they were enabled precisely by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, the leaders of this third way movement. They enthusiastically embraced globalization, open borders, uh, increasing competition from low wage countries in Asia, uh, threatening the jobs of working class uh, voters in, in the West, and also financial globalization, increasing financial instability, which is at the root of the financial crisis, but also at the root of the precarity that face, faces 
even people who, who may have decent jobs but still suffer because of the difficulty of accessing housing, because of the crazy house prices and so on. So it's not too much, much of a stretch to say it's all their fault. Obviously, that's an oversimplification because uh, conservative center-right parties were, were complicit in this, in this too. But certainly, if you want to constrain markets, produce a society in which people are more protected from the inequalities and in, insecurity generated by markets, then you would usually look to the left to, to provide some kind of solution to that. But the third way shift pretty much uh, removed that option from conventional politics and forced voters to look either to the far right or to the far left. But if we, if we take that argument a bit further, um, let's just look at the UK. Let's look at the, the, the British case. And there's a lot of, you could tease the, all of these questions out uh, in great detail. Um, it was not the Labour Party that benefited from all these changes in the past decade, right? It's been the Tory party. It's the Tory party that implemented all those austerity measures. And also were the key architects, far more than Tony Blair and New Labour, in terms of the financial, the regulatory, open capital borders model. The fund, they, 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 they constructed the growth model that underpins arguably Britain's growth crisis today uh, and all the winners and losers that come with that in the deindustrialized towns. Yes, Tony Blair and New Labour continued with it, but with kind of softer margins and a more redistributive welfare state, it's not being labor that's benefited from it. And we had a paper presented at our winter school today that seemed to suggest that labor parties, social democratic parties, that are punished by voters for sure when they take a right-wing turn on the economy, but they are also rewarded by voters if they become more socially conservative. So is that what's going on in the UK? Is like we're, We haven't talked about the cultural thing because I know you're mm -hmm. highly critical of whether the cultural dimension matters in explaining this. And I think I understand your critique because one cannot separate culture and economy in, in very easily in political economy. But what about the blue labor argument? What is it? What, what if labor took a more socially conservative turn, a more civic nationalist or civic patriotic turn on these things? Social Democrats are in a bind because traditionally they started off as parties representing the the proletarians, right? The working class, manual workers, especially union members. Also in many countries, Southern Europe in, in particular, they represented the working class of agric the agricultural mm -hmm. sector too. Um, and of course, this kind of manual labor category was never really a majority, as Adam Chavorsky argued, right? There was never really a majority of workers, which is why socialists didn't win every election when you had once you had universal suffrage, but at least there was a core of voters who very obviously could benefit from kind of socialist policies, the expansion of the welfare state, um, promotion of corporatist kind of bargaining between unions and employees and so on. And of course, over time, capitalism has changed. Those kind of jobs are just no longer there in the same numbers. Increasingly, the working class is a kind of mix of people who are living a very precarious life and don't feel terribly protected by the, the, the standard welfare state. But at the same time, we have a lot of younger voters who are highly educated and involved you know, in very highly sophisticated professions, uh, but who are also facing economic precarity and insecurity. And these voters don't see the world the same way. Social democratic parties have to try and appeal to them mm. simultaneously. They have to try and hold on to the base of the sort of so-called white working class, many of whom these days are old enough to be drawing pensions and have bought homes and therefore they're asset holders, which changes their preferences. But on the other hand, you've got to defend the people who have nothing, the people who are at the raw end, the harsh end of the labor market, at the same time as appealing to highly educated people with middle class aspirations. That's a really tricky thing to do. Mm. Um, I think the idea that just going down a socially authoritarian route, route resolves that problem is silly because, yeah, you may gain pensioners, but you will lose young university students and graduates, which these days is the core vote of most social democratic parties. So it's difficult to know exactly what to do about it, but I would say don't try that. Mm. Because obviously, Britain, the UK is a particular case. You've got a two-party system. You know, Labour has to build these coalitions within itself and across different different social groups in society. And we know from the research, from the political science research, that the, the core constituency of social democratic left liberal parties, green parties also, across 
the advanced capitalist democracies of the world, our socio-cultural professional occupational workers in the public sector and health and education, all with university graduates who tend to cluster in cities, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked about age and we've talked about region and obviously underpinning a lot of this is social class, but one could make the case now in England that it's age fundamentally, that is the core dividing line, age and education. Now you could say that's social class, but age is a clearly important factor here. Yeah, I mean, what is really striking about British politics, and American politics has also gone a similar way, but in Britain the change has been much quicker. If you kind of draw, draw a, a graph with a, a, the share of Labour voters for each age group and the share of Conservative voters, it's never been a completely even line, so these parties didn't have similar shares of the vote amongst pensioners, amongst university students. Um, but what has happened since the 2015 election is that that has become probably the single strongest predictor of whether a British voter goes for Labour or the Conservatives. So the cutoff point appears to be somewhere in the late 40s. In mm -hmm. the last election, somewhere in the early 50s. At that point, voters are more likely to vote Conservative than Labour. Mm -hmm. But if you look at sort of new voters, 18 to 25 year olds, the spot for Labour was around 60 to 70%, and amongst over 65s, the spot for the Conservatives was, was between 60 and 70%. Mm -hmm. So we have this age polarization, which is pretty new. If you look at the history of European electoral politics, we've never really, I mean, people did tend to vote Conservative a bit more as they got older, but that kind of stark difference is, is relatively new. And it's not just happening in one place, it's happening in the US too. It's also happening in Southern Europe, but in a different kind of way where actually, because the Southern European welfare state, as I mentioned before, is very pensions heavy, uh, actually pensioners have been more inclined to vote for establishment parties mm. because they're doing okay. And the people voting for anti-system parties tend to be the people who, who are not protected well by the welfare state, and they tend to be younger. So you see a, a very different kind of age divide in, in the South, but it's there too. So anti-system politics, um, how, is it different? how does it differ from populism? Is it just a different way to describe populism? Well, Which is a better concept? Um, I mean, I, I don't use the term populism for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it's used so much in the public sphere these days, in, in sort of public debate. Politicians now use the term, journalists use the term, and they use it in a, a variety of incompatible ways. And, and that's kind of stretched the concept beyond uh, useful meaning. And so I've, I've tried to kind of avoid using it because I don't want to fall into those kind of conceptual traps. Um, there are a variety of different kind of more academic understandings of the term that could be useful. But if people don't know which one you're using, then, then it can end up being misleading. The other reason is that people tend to talk about populism um, as being a form of radical right politics. Mm. So there's, you know, when people think populism, they think Donald Trump, they think Salvini, mm. you know, they think uh, Farage. But of course, a lot of what's going on is um, groups on the left, uh, Tsipras and Syriza in, in Greece, Podemos uh, in Spain, the Bloco Esquerda in Portugal, mm. even the Five Stars movement in Italy, which is not such a clearly left-wing party. And then internally within parties, Corbynism and then the exactly. USA, Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Uh, people don't usually describe Corbyn as a populist. Of course, some aspects of his discourse might sound this, this appeal to the people. The many, not the few, is in a sense a very populist turn of phrase. But I just thought it wasn't helpful to use a term that's been used in so many different ways, and which also seems to imply that the real problem is that the far right is on the rise, which is a problem. Mm. But of course, and the other part of the story is that the radical left is also on the rise, and not only. There are other kinds of anti-system politics in there too, such as independence movements in, in uh, multinational states, mm. such as Scotland uh, in the UK, Catalonia uh, in, in Spain, and, and so on, which can also be seen as anti-system movements, and they've also benefited from the unstable politics of the last decade. And we have seen an anti-system government in Italy, at least. Absolutely. With, uh, with Lega and the Five Star Movement. Yeah, very briefly. And, and part of the reason that government no longer, <laughs> no longer is in office is precisely because it was very difficult to bring together the so-called populist right and the so-called populist center or left because they were at loggerheads on so many different issues. So I think using the term anti-system politics, it's more neutral. It doesn't necessarily imply that you're on the left or on the right. But it, what it does mean is that you're standing for um, a change in the way 
a democracy is governed, a change not only in the personnel of government, but in the way uh, uh, we are governed, the way in which politicians interact with voters. And is a vote for the Tory party an anti-system vote now? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question, because of course, a lot of what Boris Johnson has been doing has been pressing this button, I'm going to get Brexit done. I mean, Brexit, if ever there was an anti-system appeal, it's Brexit, mm. right? Because it means really tearing apart a lot of the institutional arrangements that's given Britain. Mm. For, for the past few decades. But at the same time, he's also representing the Conservative Party, which is, you know, the longest living, surviving political party in, in Western democracies, and which always makes appeals to stability. So it's a very kind of awkward mix. And of course, it'll be interesting to see which way he, he goes on Brexit, whether he goes for a radical clean break, which could be very disruptive, or whether he tries to kind of settle things down and, um, and 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 make it more conservative with a small c appeal. You know, you live in a strange world when voting Republican or voting for the Tory party is a, an anti-system vote. That certainly yeah. has suggests something is strange things going on. Yeah, but I mean, if the system is market liberalism plus social liberalism, which you could probably say was the kind of consensus of governing parties mm. between the mid '90s and the mid 2000s then yeah you know um to push back against that you know um right-wing parties are pushing back against the social liberal um consensus but they're also pushing back against aspects of the market liberal or neoliberal mm. economic consensus too especially in relation to trade obviously trump has launched a trade war against china um and and, and the appeal to immigration controls in both the uk and the us and in many some european countries as well um, is implies that uh, you're trying to curb the, the internationalization of the labor market, if you like. Mm. And that's before we even talk about Russia or China or Brazil or India. So, I mean, this type of anti-system politics, particularly, clearly, I would say, electorally seems to be more successful on the right, mm. um, is it, part of this change. Yeah. Um, there's a limit to what you can do in a book. I <laughs> stuck with Europe and the US, but uh, <laughs> clearly <laughs> Bolsonaro and... Uh, and other similar uh, um, figures in, in different countries around the world could, could be in, in understood in the same way. Okay, Jonathan. Well, as you say, your book is coming out in April in the, U or in the US. It's coming out in April, April in the United in the US, States. April in the US, June in the UK. June in the UK. And uh, yeah, I encourage... With Oxford University Press. With Oxford University Press and anti-system policy is topical anyway. But I'm sure we will be debating uh, the future of British politics and social democracy for at least the next decade. I'm sure we will. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to you. It's been a pleasure.